All right, we're heading out to do a podcast with John Ship, Mr. Film here in Kansas City. So let's see how it goes. Well, 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 welcome to the mayhem. Dick and Loy mayhem. Media mayhem. Market in a mayhem. You might love it, you might hate it. Here's my favorite freaking show. Lloyd, introduce our guest. Dick, anything about film in Kansas City, it points to our guest, John Shipp, who is, uh, gosh, John, what? You, you're uh, you're Old known timer. as the film peddler. <laughs> the film peddler. That's that was, right. That was a self-appellation because uh, motion picture distribution has always been one of my loves. In the 70s, when I was uh, had my own distribution company after I worked for MGM for eight or nine years, uh, it's uh, that's how I still think of myself, even though for the last 30, 35 years, I've worked from the other angle, the exhibition perspective instead of the distribution perspective, you know. Wow. But, uh, but yeah. life is sweet, yeah. You know, uh, you had, you've had a sweet life. There's a, a lot of terms there that we need to look into. First off, um, Film Row, what does that mean to Kansas City? What does that term mean? Well, uh, historically, the motion picture industry, domestic theatrical here, USA and Canada, yeah. uh, has maintained around 32 different areas of the country where they had their film exchanges as such, where Paramount opened up. Uh, um, Columbia, MGM, Fox, uh, Disney, et cetera, et cetera. They had their offices there, and along with the distribution offices would come all of the suppliers, the popcorn people, the seats people, the projection people, the ticket people. Uh, uh, the entire industry uh, would locate in, in, a, in, a, in a small area that would allow exhibitors from these little towns in Kansas, Missouri to come to town and to make their deals in, in, in a finite area. So the film row area in Kansas City, Missouri specifically, is, is, is the nexus of it is 18th and Wyandotte. Mm -hmm. So it, you can just kind of go in that little area around there and that's where everybody was located. Everybody, I mean, that is film row. And, and around the country, uh, because of gentrification and just the changes in, in, in real estate values, uh, there's practically no other film row areas that have as many of their original buildings extant now as they as um, as Kansas City does. So we're one of the few really surviving film row areas where we still got MGM, their building, Fox's building, Universal's building, uh, Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. So film row is that's where you went to buy your film and buy your popcorn. Would they send the films there for distribution yes. to the theaters? Yes. Okay. The film shippers uh, right here it would have been, uh, actually we had our own little company called Independent Film Shippers back in the 70s mm -hmm. because we were dealing in, in a lot of volume. Uh, but uh, but the, the studios maintain a huge, huge collection of their physical prints right here because of the central location. Kansas City, and, and the interesting thing about Old Film Row here in Kansas City, that it appears that, uh, th that our film row was one of the first ones in the country. And it would have started maybe as long ago as around the turn of the 19th century, around uh, 1898 to 1902 in that area, there would have been some people who were exchanging films with other little theaters uh, because, you know, after you play it a week, it's pretty much every, your audience has seen it back mm -hmm. then. Holy cow, what kind of a film would have been in existence at that time? Uh, you know, what Sally kind Rand of fan film? dance on a. Uh, yes. Yes, among other things, uh, exactly. Uh, it, it would have been... Uh, Who was a Kansas City? Well, uh, the Kansas City's production industry would have been uh, a little bit later than, than the exhibition part of it. Uh, but if you want to get into that and some of the early history here, we've got a couple of fascinating characters who are absolutely iconic figures that no one has ever heard of. Really? Uh, yeah. In 1904, here in Kansas City, Missouri, there was a, um, uh, a retired fire chief by the name of, uh, give me just a second, George C. Hale, Captain George C. Hale. He had traveled the world representing Kansas City's fire department. I mean the entire world. He had won these international awards for innovations in fighting fires. He developed these, uh, these uh, special ladders, all kinds of special equipment uh, that, that allowed people to get these fires out quicker. And he was a really greatly well-known guy in that particular end of it. But uh, uh, he came across someone who had an idea and then got together with another guy. And they developed something called Hale's Touring Cars. Uh, and what it is, they started with a Pullman train car, 
right here in Kansas City. It would seat around 70 people. Uh, they put, put a little screen at one end of it. They set it up on gimbals, and speaking of uh, uh, gimbals. The and gimbals Macy's on the camera, too. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, set it up that way. They had sound effects on the outside, and in the front of the but just say that this is the, uh, uh, the the Pullman car right in the front right there. They would be showing uh, footage of different cities from around the world. But while people were sitting in their chairs watching them in, in their things, there would be people outside who would be doing sound effects. Like if you were looking at this travel log thing for Switzerland, you'd be going up the, the, the mountains and you would hear the creek, 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 and then the, the whistle of this and the horn blowing and the... Uh, it, it was absolutely, <laughs> you're exactly right, man. You're exactly right. Uh, but what happened was after Early he introduced it, work. Uh, yeah. um, so so uh, the first one that was used that was shown was at the at the World's Fair or the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. But he came back to Kansas City, of course, and refined it. And in 1906, I believe it was at Electric Park, he wow. opened up. Uh, one that was actually a twin. I mean, you had a 70-seater here and right behind it another one. Uh, but they built a, a huge facade for it, and it was a an instant smash hit at Electric Park, which again, if you guys know the history of Electric Park, fascinating place. It was Electric Park that caused Walt Disney to come up with Disney World, mm -hmm. or Disneyland, I should yeah, say, is the sure. first one. Uh, uh, and he borrowed so much from Electric Park. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And it was right uh, off the east of the plaza, was it? Uh, Electric um, Park or east of out here? I think it was around 40th and a Prospect or, or around there. There were okay. actually two Electric Parks. The original one was built next to the Heim Brothers Brewery, which at the time... Down the River Market area, uh, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. you're right. But but at this time, this was in the late 1800s. It was the largest brewery in the world. Mm -hmm. So so they had it there for a few years and just outgrew the space and ended up opening it up separately. But while they had it there, I, I read somewhere that they had a direct uh, a line going uh, uh, from the brewery to there, so they could uh, uh, ship the the beer over as it was brewed all the way to people <laughs> to be drinking it there. Unbelievable! Uh, and, 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 that, and that was Electric Park, mind you. So oh, this city is cow. so full of history. But but back to George Hale and his touring cars. Mm -hmm. Within a few years, within four or five years, there were over five hundred locations for these touring cars. You know, he he sold the rights for Great Britain for like twenty thousand dollars, which back then, a hundred years ago, a hundred plus years ago, hell, mm, it was. Uh, a whole lot of money. Uh, people like Adolf Zucker, who was the founder of Paramount Pictures, people like Louis Mayer, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, these guys at the time were running little either Nickelodeons or Penny Arcades in New York City and thereabouts. When they heard of this thing, they grabbed a hold of it. And the bottom line is, uh, this Hales Touring Cars for a few years had this fabulous run around the world, Beijing, Mexico City, Europe, South America, you name it. They were located all over the world and, and they did fantastic business for a short period of time. But it was essentially like this was the linchpin between uh, Penny Arcades and Nickelodeons, and uh, people have never even heard about this. That is fabulous a fascinating. Story. And has anybody ever done a documentary where they've no, replicated no, this? Uh, no. scene? And quite I frankly, mean, it's unbelievable. Well, yeah, it is. It's just <laughs> just one tiny segment, man. Uh, and and at the time, maybe ten or fifteen years ago, when I first started coming across this and everything, well, my initial thought was, you know, we've got to do this in Union Station. What a perfect permanent exhibit you'd have yeah. and instead of uh, 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 Switzerland or, uh, or, or Berlin you know we'd be showing Kansas City and all of its great attractions mm -hmm. for the area like that but again it, it's you know it's so easy to have we got thousands of ideas so easy to have those ideas oh but my. but but carrying them through to fruition is a different story so no no we've never been able to do anything about it but what a wonderful subject that would be for some type of a documentary sure would be yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well wow. you I have a feeling you got a lot of these stories you you know more about oh, film yeah. history, I think, probably. Than no, not not really. It's just I'm older, man. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm so old that I've lived through these things like that, so it appears that I do. But no, there are there are much more, uh, much much more articulate and much more knowledgeable people about. They can't be more down articulate. In the weeds. You started oh, yeah, back yeah. at uh, wait. What was MGM? Started with MGM as a student booker at sixty-two dollars and fifty cents a week in Memphis, Tennessee, in nineteen sixty-three. As a matter of fact. It's been fun every fucking step of the way. <laughs> it's been fun. That that's always been kind of my guiding, my guiding light and everything is is, is to have fun, to enjoy well, you, yourself. Have you man. ever veered outside of the film world? Oh, for, oh, to make a buck? 
Well, or have you always just stayed make, on that track somehow? Yeah, or no, I think making making a buck has just never been one of my priorities. I'm between fortunes right now. Probably will be for a while. <laughs> it's just never been a priority for me. Yeah. What's always been fun is it's not the thrill of the chase, but it's just it's coming up with something that looks like it makes sense that you can help make happen if you can get the right people together and then moving from there. Sure, it, it's yeah. how we started. Yeah. It's how we started Cinema KC ten or twelve years ago. It's how we started. Thank you, Walt Disney, Butch and me, and actually John Hart. John, John Hart, Hart yeah, was one of the original guys too, yeah. on there. In fact, John had the original idea of doing a statue of Walt Disney. He called Butch, this would have been 20, 25 years ago. He called Butch and, because he knew Butch was a Disney thing, and we were working on a little documentary on yeah. young Walt Disney at the time, which Butch never finished. Mobster. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so John called Butch and said, hey man, come on, no one has ever honored Walt Disney here in his own home. What are we going to do? So then Butch immediately called me, of course, because we worked together on the film stuff. The big money stuff, we didn't work together. That was all his. He made the big money. <laughs> I worked on the not-for-profit stuff that never made a penny off of that cost us thousands of dollars, uh -huh. So, which, which is what we wanted. Okay. You're a business so, spender. Is what you're <laughs> well, no, wait a minute. You apparently, I think, I heard that you made yeah. $22 million distributing independent films. Where is that money? I did, but that was then and this is now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was in the 70s uh, when when I handled uh, uh, films like uh, Harper Valley PTA and the original Halloween and Toby Haliki's Gone in 60 Seconds, what a character. You, you know that uh, they uh, uh, Disney did a remake of it starring Nicolas Cage on Gone in 60 Seconds, but okay. the original one that Toby Haliki made, have, have you guys ever even heard of it? No. Oh, I don't man. think so, no. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you must. Absolutely fabulous, fabulous film. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's a long story, but, uh, but a good one. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, back in the 70s, we were very fortunate because the company that I had, Thomas and Chip Films, uh, which I just incorporated my name after I bought the company from Howard Thomas, who was retiring, mm -hmm. had a fabulous lady, Mary Hayslip, who was uh, our uh, office manager and handled all the, the tough stuff and uh, uh, just had a great crew of people and we were fortunate enough to be able to open some offices in St. Louis and Des Moines and for about eight or ten years uh, we were pretty pretty dominant in the independent distribution uh, end of it. You were people, booking those things all over the place? Well mostly yeah. just in, in a couple of thousand theaters in the central part of the country. Okay. Uh, in the, right. uh, 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 we handled the exchange areas of St. Louis, Kansas City, Des Moines, Omaha, mm -hmm. and then there were other people like me who had, you know, Dallas, Chicago, New York, Jacksonville, Denver, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Roger Corman uh, was one of the guys that, that I made a whole lot of money with. We invested name, money in yeah. these things, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, Roger had some of these great drive-in exploitation movies. And, uh, and we, we cut a pretty fat hog back in the 70s yeah. like that. Was and there ever a Roger Corman movie without cleavage? I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, I don't think so. I, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't remember one. It, it was mostly. I, I'm not sure if this is G-rated, but it's mostly fighting and fucking. Oh, I yeah, mean, I mean sure. that, that was that was okay. kind of the. Yeah. And 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 I used to be told by various people that work with Roger that when he was looking at a screenplay like that, if three if three pages went by without some fighting and fucking, he said, you know, fix it, fix it. You know, three, three pages max, man. Rewrite. You, 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 you got to wake up those guys in the back of the driving oh, theater wow, like that. Yeah. But uh, but we, we had a we had a fabulous run, uh, uh, had fabulous times. Uh, I ended up um, uh, my my character is sometimes and, and my ethics and morals just just aren't as strong as they could be. And and I got involved in all the coke snorting, dope taking, limousine driving, Concord flying, uh, you know, can film festival. You know, I, I got in the middle of all that stuff. Oh, well, that's disgusting. And I just ended Dick, up. I, I just ended up. Yeah, you know, uh, 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 that's right. That's it. This, this, you know, small children don't listen. Yes. No. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh well. But uh, <laughs> that's so. Something. I mean, uh, you know. But but even in the middle of all of it and everything, we we were we had such a great group of people working that that we kept going. If I hadn't have gotten involved in in trying to produce the films that Roger was doing and others. Uh, I'd probably still be peddling film, but yeah, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but what happened was uh, we put together a little limited partnership here in maybe 75 or 76 to make a little film called The Student Body, which we made here in Kansas City, which actually we came out okay on it. But then on the super van, uh, two or three years later, uh, I, I went so far over my skis, I, I think someone used that term. Super van, yes. In that particular film, that, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, my, my cash, and, and then the major companies started going after the stuff that I needed, like, um, uh, 
oh golly, the Burt Reynolds uh, chase things, uh, Smokey and the Bandit. Smokey and the Bandit, uh, yeah. These uh, Last House on the Left type films mm -hmm. like that, the, the ones that were our bread and butter as such, the major started handling. And the bottom line is, in, in uh, the latter part of 1980, I mean, I was just, uh, I, was, I was really screwed up emotionally, physically, mentally, in every way. The companies were going belly up. Oh. And fool that I was, uh, I saw myself as someone that, okay, I'll just get away for a few years and I'll come back and we'll just kick ass again. Mm -hmm. and figured that's how life worked, you know, because yeah. I'd been uh, I'd been so naive and, and I made so much money in such a short period of time, you know, I mean, it was just uh, more money than you could spend almost. So I, I jumped in my car with my nose full of coke and headed down south. Uh, finally hit the coast, I guess, uh, maybe in Mobile and traveled on around, kept on traveling down that coast. Ended up at the end of St. Pete Beach, Florida, at a little area there that's called Passagrill. Uh, hundreds of years earlier, it had been used, uh, the beaches there had been used to um, uh, smoke fish. Uh, it was the pass of the grillers. They would stick their fish on there and, and take them back to Cuba after they'd been uh, smoked in the sun. But um, there was this little pier there and a little bait shop and charter boat service around there. And so I went in and rotted, uh, rented a rod and reel and went out there and, and sat on the edge of that uh, pier and was listening to the birds uh, chirping, the, uh, not chirping, uh, mm -hmm. flying overhead and the, the halyards banging against a couple of the uh, uh, sailboats and this. And I says, man, this is really a nice place. So I went in there and this old guy that owned it, it was a guy named Dutch. It was owned by the city of St. Pete Beach, leased to him. But he said, I said, hey, you want to sell this thing? He said, yeah. You know, so I said, how much? He said, I don't know, four or five thousand, whatever it was. It was nothing at the time, you yeah. know, even though. I, uh, but uh, so I said, yeah, let's do it, you know. So that's where I ended up settling for a couple of years. Wow. wow. And had fabulous times. Unfreaking believable John's times. John's living the Jimmy Buffett life. Yeah. That's what he is. Yeah. <laughs> living yeah. and dying. So tell us about the good times. times. Yeah. I mean, let's talk oh, about the good man. times a little well, bit. Well, yeah. okay. Good times. Uh, uh, had a little 20 foot Riballo open fisherman with, I don't know, maybe 150 Merc on the back to, uh, and a little extra kicker, of course. And me and a couple of my old mullet buddies or the people that hung around the shop, uh, you know, we'd go and we'd catch a few little uh, stingrays and then some uh, uh, other little fish, but we'd catch these little stingrays and use them for shark fishing. So we'd take the, 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 the boat out in the afternoon uh, as it was getting ready to have these incoming tides and we'd uh, 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 hook up a couple of rigs on the back, these big old 10, 11 alt pin rigs, I've forgotten, huge things for shark fishing. And we'd put one high and one low, and then we'd sit back there and we'd roll a number, and we'd turn on uh, either Buffett or the Stones, mm -hmm. you know, and we'd sit there and smoke, and you'd just wait for that click, 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 because when the shark, before they would grab that bait, they would normally brush up against it. They could tell somehow with their skin whether it was edible or not okay. by brushing up against yeah. it. So when they would do that click, 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 then you would immediately kind of come out of your Buffett haze and say, whoa, wait a minute. you stand up there, then you'd wait again, a little click, click, click. Okay, and then finally, click, 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 and you'd jump up and you'd grab that thing as hard as you could, bam, and try to set it, <laughs> try, try, try to set that thing, you know, and that hook in that hard shark mouth. And, uh, and the fight would be on. I was a lousy fisherman. I was even a lousier boat captain. I tell you, man, I, I, I just never got the, the, I just never learned how to drive a boat properly. I was always running into piers and docks and sand and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, those were joyous times. We would float in on that incoming tide. We'd always catch and release unless we were gonna be eating them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the guy, there were so many people that hung around that bait shop area and they were from every walk of life. You're talking about a disparate group, man. They were, you know, doctors, lawyers, you know, bums. There was one, there were three different people named Eddie who hung around. There was window washer Eddie, uh, there was a, a dredger Eddie, and then there was two dick Eddie. Okay, Two Dick Eddie, big old fat guy, always had his t-shirt on, and he had a, a, a navel that was an Audi that would stick out like that on oh, really? t-shirt. And that's why we called him Two Dick, to differentiate himself. But, but he, and he has some unbelievable stories too about, about taking these little 12-foot sailboats around, uh, around the South American Cape right there, and uh, oh man, all kinds of lies and stories. But he could cook unbelievably, unbelievably. So what would happen, these big long liners would come in there to, to fill up with diesel or gas, 
And these longliners, if, if you know about them, they would set up miles and miles of line behind them. And it would take them like hours to go back and check for the swordfish. And by the time they checked the early sets on the lines and everything, sometimes some of the swordfish would have been attacked by sharks. They might have taken mm -hmm. a big bite out of mm -hmm. them so they wouldn't be able to sell them at the fish market. So what would happen was they would still bring them in, they'd cut out around that big shark bite, and they would stake those darn things out. So they would trade us the swordfish stakes we would go in and get some fresh shrimp and trade them some shrimp or some gas, whatever. But but uh, but then we'd catch a few little sheep's head or flounder or gag grouper off the end of the pier, and we'd get some of our frozen squid that we sold for bait, some of those shrimp, some of that, uh, and, and, and Two Dick Eddie would start chopping up uh, that ginger and those herbs and spices and make up this huge pot of, of our own Paso Grill bouillon base that was just no, only only better I've had was in the south of France, as a matter of fact, when it comes to bouillon base. Wow. Wonderful stuff. But uh, but those were fun. But probably the top memories had to do with the space shuttle launches that I went to there. Hmm. Three different times. Number one, number three, and number five. And and guys, you know, stop me, please. Stop me. I mean, you know, if, if you want, if I start veering off. Well, no, yeah, that's fine. Veering off is good. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. I like okay. the stream of consciousness with John Sheff is, is a fun ride. It is. Uh, it is. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm buckled in. One, one, <laughs> of, one, one of my old buddies, Bill, uh, Bill, 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 damn. Bill was a, uh, a mullet fisherman. And if you've ever seen the mullet boats, okay, Bill Miller, Bill Miller, how can I forget that? Uh, the mullet boats, uh, you would stand in the front of this maybe 20-foot wooden boat with a, a kicker in the middle right there, and, and you would be standing up in the, in, in the prow of the boat, you know, like hold on to something like this, or, or if you had a console, you know, uh, and, and you'd be like this guy going into battle on the top of an elephant, and, 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 Bill, and, and that's why Bill loved it, I think, it was the romance of that. But Bill said, man, they're getting ready to launch the first space shuttle. I would love to go to that, and he said. He said, "I, I know the address uh, of, of the uh, the NASA uh, publicity, marketing, advertising, whatever it was called, headquarters in Washington D.C." He said, "But uh, but you know, I don't know how to go about doing." It. And I said, "Oh, come on, man, it's easy." We'll, uh, we'll do a little documentary of, about the space shuttle launch, and maybe we'll be able to sell some footage to one of the TV stations around here. But it'll be really simple. So I went down to the printing place nearby, and we did some Paso Grill Productions, put it on the nice letterhead, you know, with, with the names of, you know, this guy was, uh, uh, was you know, mm -hmm. uh, the director, the producer, the you name it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but we had a list of like Dick Eddie. catering to Dick Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> we had like uh, oh ten or twelve of us, you know, that I put on the stationery, sent it out to NASA. Sure enough, man, they wrote back and said, "Yes, sir, we're happy to. We'll give you the, your crest credentials, press credentials, and everything." Wow. So we rented a big old RV and uh, you know took a few kegs and cases of beer because everybody was big drinkers back then. And, and we headed out uh, across the state of Florida uh, to either Kennedy or Canaveral. I forgot what it was called back then. And of course, the first space shuttle shot was really an amazing uh, media event for the entire world. I mean, there, there were TV crews from all over the world attending that. Uh, but, but we went through the line and we got our credentials. So here's a group of people in, in cut off shorts and uh, you know uh, no socks and a t-shirt. And we had one little, one of those little yellow underwater cameras was the only camera we had because everything else fell out. <laughs> so uh, we didn't get a lot of good shots, but the experience, the night before the launch, which usually took place five, six, seven o'clock early in the morning, the night before the launch, you've got these thousands of media people from all over the world that are on the infill there. They had some stands there. They, they have the countdown clock, a digital countdown clock between you and the, uh, uh, and, and the uh, Columbia mm -hmm. sitting there getting ready to go up. And then over to the left was the vehicle assembly uh, uh, building, which is the largest building, I think, enclosed in the world. We went, we toured that. So here we are, a group of crazy fishermen, you know, who knew nothing about anything, uh, uh, just having a great time walking around with everybody with all these thousands of huge cameras, this and that. And during the entire time that you're there, you, you see these police people with their dogs and they're walking around just everywhere sniffing around. And then you see these other people clicking, 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 taking, because back then you didn't even have digital as I recall it, it was just clicking. Mm -hmm. And we found out later, they were taking pictures of everybody because they had a, a, a back blackout tent and everything that they would uh, uh, compare those faces to any known uh, terrorist type thing. Oh. So, so we cleared that. Okay. 
when we got hungry, we would just go to one of the networks. They had um, these uh, uh, trailers set up with, with a line of food through there, a buffet, and you know you didn't have to ID yourself, so we ate free. And we collected all this printed material from all these different companies from all over the world that were involved in one facet or another of the production of things. So, and, 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 and I'll, I'll try to hurry this up, okay, but, but, but back to number one again. Uh, when, when it finally, it was actually delayed a day or two and we had to come back, but let's just say, okay, that, they got that countdown going on the, on the infield clock there, there, you know, the zero, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Uh, by the time it got to one or two seconds, you see this big round puff of smoke at the bottom of this thing. It's gray at first. And then a second later, the sound hits you, bam, like that. I mean, it hits you, it just immerses you. You're just sitting there just vibrating with the sound. And then that gray turns to gold and yellow and orange and just starts spreading out like this. And that big beast just starts going straight up in the air like that. And everybody is screaming and yelling so much <laughs> you can't hear anything with the sound, but everybody is just rejoicing the fact that America did it right because we were doing a lot of things wrong back then, unlike now, <laughs> unlike now, oh God. Uh, but but those were thrilling experiences to, wow. to go to those things. Uh, my brother-in-law, Bob Nelson, from uh, either Indianapolis or Tampa at the time, wanted to go, so we included family members at later ones. But but uh, on the one that Bob went to, uh, uh, right before the countdown, he went and walked up right next to the digital readout clock with the countdown clock, and he was wearing like the, you know red, green, blue, white, a really colorful outfit there, just standing there by it. And uh, the next week, when Newsweek or Time came out, they had a double truck page of the blowout, and he was standing there right at the end of it. Like, wow. it, it was, it was, yeah, that That's was funny. So you kind of got back into film, I generally, through that photojournalistic uh, endeavor or whatever. I mean, uh, you were you were out fishing, and and you kind of got pulled Something back brought you into. Off the dock. Well, what brought me off the dock was the no-name storm of the summer of, I think, 1983 or 84, quite frankly, mm -hmm. it's still a little foggy back there. Uh, but, uh, but we had a, 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 it essentially blew my bait shop into Boca Ciega Bay there, which is where we were located, right? right? Boca Ciega Bay mm -hmm. leading right into the Gulf like that, and totally wiped out, put what I had in storage and. Uh, I think that was the time that I went down to Key West for about a year and because uh, I'd come into a little small windfall enough to keep me fishing all Key West a fabulous place. I'm yeah, sure you guys know it have been there many times. Yeah. Yeah, what you got there that, that I always enjoyed, uh, walking drunken down uh, uh, Duval there, going mm -hmm. to the Bull and going on down the line there. Ooh, uh, but uh, but the mixture of the gay crowd there, the artistic crowd there, the conks, the people that were born there, the chickens, uh, uh, the roosters, oh, well, run around, oh, love that early in the morning, uh -huh. man, driving around. Mm -hmm. You know, every block had its own little rooster. I used to yep. love that crowing in the morning like that. Yeah, and then you got the uh, well, you got all these fishing communities, and then the tourists, mostly from Germany and Canada, that were coming down there. And you got this wonderful mill, this wonderful mixture of all these nationalities and cultures and societies coming together right there in that one little place. Back I, I in those days, yeah. it was really magic, wasn't it? Yeah, magic's a good word for it. It was on. I was there yeah. on a cruise yeah. a couple of times and rented a bicycle, rode all over the place. Yeah. So it's a great place. I, I didn't have a car when I was living down there because that's all you needed is a bicycle. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's a it's a great place. It's the same thing in New York City, as a matter of fact. When I was living in, in in the West Village there, you know, I didn't have a car or a bicycle, but hell, New York. One of the great walkable cities in the world. Mm -hmm. Fabulous, fabulous place. Loved it. Good well, time. we're in this but, room here with we're surrounded by film posters, and we're in a cool space. One of Butch Rigby's developments at six hundred one East Sixty Third Street, and in, in in the room we've got. I'm assuming you have some kind of connection to to the films that are up that are posters up here. Well, the, the, right? it, it's a peripheral connection with a lot of them because I, I, uh, Butch and I have been collecting movie memorabilia for the last 25, 35, 40 years. And we've got literally, he's got his collection of many thousands. I've got my collection of many thousands. These are just some that happen to be at the top that I flat put on the wall because so no it was handy. No, no, here no, 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 not these, really, not really. Look well, you around know. at these. Talk, tell us about some of these films that, oh. that you have some memories attached to them. We've got Kansas City Bomber here. We've got a lot of local. Yeah. Well, I, I would rather talk about the connection with, with those three posters right there, which we did uh, 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 when we were having um, Film Fest Kansas City at, um, on the, pla no, yeah, Cinemark on the plaza right there. 
uh, uh, I, I forget, darn it, I wish I remembered the agency that did those for us. Uh, but a, a, a lot of these are just some that, again... Uh, and what year was that? Oh, man, I, I, I don't know. I'm guessing 20 years ago, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, but there's one on the corner there that, that I have a very special connection to. Oh, now there's Filmfest Kansas City 2000. Uh, and Filmfest Kansas City is now called Kansas City Filmfest International. Uh, I think they are, they're, they've expanded the, the scope and the draw. Well, tell us about that. Tell us about Filmfest and well, how all that came uh, to be. Well, Filmfest, uh, when we started uh, uh, the Film Society of Greater Kansas City, I think around 28 years ago, I think around 91 maybe, uh, we, we started it, it was following the Robert Altman Film Festival. Uh -huh. uh, the, the Film Commission here of Kansas City, the Greater Kansas City Film Commission, uh, I wasn't a member, but uh, Lou Vaughn, one of my buddies, was a member, and he was in California most of the time, so I attended the meetings with him, and I ended up, uh, John Altman and I ended up uh, becoming the um, uh, uh, chairman of the Robert Altman Film Festival, and we brought about uh, 22 or 24 of Bob Altman's movies into, it was actually the Crown Center Theater at the time, and uh, had a festival f for several days, bought Bob Altman in, gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of cool, and uh, got, I don't know, he signed so many autograph posters for us of the thing, I don't have one up here right now. But, uh, but because of that, we realized that, you know what, we, we probably should uh, develop some type of a vehicle that would allow us to have some type of annual film festival. Mm -hmm. And that's how the idea started. But people like Carol Barta, uh, Butch, Butch Rigby, of course, and myself, and uh, quite a few others, uh, M.L. Bass, uh, Susan Lawrence, uh, uh, just, just a lot of great people uh, came together. We met month after month and finally ended up setting up that not-for-profit called the Film Society of Greater Kansas City. Talked to Jerry at the Tivoli and said we want to do our first meeting there. So we went in this big auditorium uh, that seated I think 180, filled that up and had another couple hundred people waiting, had to move to a different one. And, and really for many years, Man, that little not-for-profit, uh, we brought in so many filmmakers and, and we developed Film Fest Kansas City out of that. Mm. Uh, but that, that's how the festival got started and, and, and it was, um, and it's still going, the film society is still going, that's still going, mm -hmm. uh, Cinema KC, so, you know. So thank you, thank you Walt Disney. Bob Altman. Pardon? You yeah. got to know Robert and then oh, sure. the other family member you mentioned. Oh, John Altman, John's a, a local guy and yeah. he's done a whole lot of stuff. You probably met John No, before. John, sure. Uh, back in the 70s, when I had my office at, uh, oh man, what is that address? It was a building there in Westport where Asiatica was, yeah. Ron Rook's record shop. Right, were. right, uh, Music we, Exchange. Yeah. Music Exchange, yeah. Ryan, we, we, uh, were on, we were on the Rooks. second floor there. Joe Service owned that building. And Joe sure. is still one of my closest buddies. We still have breakfast Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday of every week. Every the week. Cup, I believe. Uh, At the Cup yeah, with Joe, I've, yeah. I've seen you guys around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, why the hell didn't you come over and say hello, man? I mean, well, I on. walk by and wave. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. And, and, and Butch is there Wednesday and Friday, you know, so we've got our own little niche. I just got a little while ago, uh, actually, a couple hours ago, got a, a text from a buddy of mine at Exwa, which I go to occasionally, and uh, uh, he, sa he said, uh, Brian Cranston's been here for the last two hours, hmm. and he said, drinking coffee, and I said, cool, you know, he's breaking beans, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so a few minutes after that, he texted back and says, no, it's not Brian, uh, uh, Brian, it's, uh, it's uh, Chris Cooper, oh, Chris you know, who Cooper. lives here okay, locally, sure. of course. Oh. And uh, so, Does Chris big, still live here? Mistake. In uh, the area? I, I don't believe so. No, I, I no. haven't spoken to him in many years, many yeah. many years since he won his Academy Award. Sure, as a matter of yeah, fact. yeah. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he, his mom was here and had a whole lot of family here, mm -hmm. and a lot of our people like Ann McFerrin uh, uh, went to school with him. Uh, I think maybe y'all, you guys know Lonnie Shelton. You're into baseball, right? Aren't you? Little I, th bit. I thought I saw well, you with the. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, okay. I, I know a little L bit Lon about Lonnie, it. I, Lonnie does a newsletter about baseball, politics, and history here in Kansas City that is absolutely fascinating. Hmm. That, uh, uh, if you're interested in Kansas City political history, uh, he and some other attorney, Mike White and uh, uh, Postinelli, started Postinelli, White, and Shelton, which is still a, a huge law firm, oh, as yeah. you know. And he does a he does a fantastic newsletter. Yeah. You know, that yeah. if you are interested, let me know and I'll forward it to you, and he'll put you on his list. But uh, got talk, great uh, political history. Talk to me about another uh, um, thing I see here poster. Yeah. Um, 
69 minutes. Oh, isn't that, isn't that embarrassing? There's it's a lot horrible. of local older people in the city who, as young people, were in that movie. I love the way you, you struggle with not using the word talent when you said local, and then you <laughs> hesitated to not say local talent. And that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, well, Jack Poseger was the executive producer of it, and Jack yeah. still does. Jack goes to the movies sure, and sure. has been around many, many years, and yeah. is a fabulous fella, one of my dearest, dearest mm -hmm. buddies. He writes some things on, for Hearn's uh, Yeah, he does. Website, he uh, does. Blog. Yeah, that he does. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lou Jane Temple, and Lou Jane I saw a couple of weeks ago, and she's published 10 books now, I think yeah. she said, 10 I novels. Know, right. Right. But, she uh, she does Lou, mysteries uh, related to food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Very, but, very uh, popular and, stuff. And Lou Jane, as I recall, was kind of one of the progenitors of the Westport area. I mean, she was down there in like, I think the 60s, really before it started. Oh, yeah. uh, down in the Westport up. trucker area era. Yes, yes, as she a matter of fact. There. She of and Sal Capra and some of those other old timers. Sal Capra, what a sweet man. Too bad he's gone. He was a interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. Sal was my general partner on a couple of those productions. Oh, is that right? He was my general partner okay. on uh, Student Body and Superman. But this film, 69 Minutes, was a spoof on 60 Minutes, the radio show. Uh, Joe Leahy, who is a, a very talented voiceover guy, was mm -hmm. one of the uh, producers and acted in it. And, uh, you know, we, we sat around, a guy named Ian Morrison directed it. Ian's claim to fame was a movie that he had made earlier called Slime Town Blues, that uh, when we premiered it at the Midland Theater downtown, we had put some uh, uh, bumper stickers for a slime job come to the Midland Theater. Stan Derwood saw those on some car and said, get those things off. I don't want to see a slime job at the Midland Theater. <laughs> uh, so, so we took the bumper stickers off, but, but when we had the premiere on this film, Slime Town Blues, we gave away free turkeys. We had turkeys in these little wooden crates out front of the theaters, you know. And, and the glasses that we gave people, you know, were not transparent because it was, you know, if you watched it, it was so bad it would bother you but that was uh, the, the, the big payoff scene in that particular film I remember Ian telling me this yeah we had this old station wagon man and we we're gonna run it up this hill and then crash it and that was gonna be the you know the denouement even though he didn't use that word mm -hmm. uh, so they shot the scene fabulous check the, uh, the the cameras no no film in the camera so they lost that film oh, my. that was kind of the way the production okay. went and it's kind of the way this film went right there 69 minutes 69 well, I remember my buddy Katie McGuckin was in it oh I think. Katie she, Katie was great she yeah. brings it up yeah. an awful <laughs> oh, lot you got you you're kidding aren't you I know I serious I think uh, she has mentioned it to me a time oh time. man that yeah. re that reminds me <laughs> one of Bob man Bob was my attorney and my partner in in the Bijou early on yeah uh, sure uh, Bob's out in Colorado now, but BG Theater, which was in Westport. Yeah, uh, in, in Westport. Uh, home back of the, in the Dick 70s. and Jay Friday morning radio broadcast. Home of the Friday morning Dick and Jay Where radio broadcast. I still broadcast. have guys come up to me in the supermarket and say, I skipped school on Friday mornings and came down there. Oh, so. you're kidding. Yeah. You're kidding. <laughs> Wow, Quite well, that's, a show. That's, yeah. that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. What about Wonderful. the Bijou? Anything else about the Bijou? Oh, the Bijou was, uh, uh, oh man, fabulous little theater. Never made a penny there, of course not. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it was essentially a, a retro house. You know, we would print up calendars and we would book films in advance. And, you know, all the John Waters films and the Fellini films and all these little kitschy art films that wouldn't play anyplace else, we would play them there at the Bijou. But the Bijou's, uh, what really got the Bijou on the map? was a film called The Rocky Horror Picture Show, which, oh, as you yeah. guys know, the sure. first really primal screen movie mm -hmm. right there. Uh, I, I, it was playing in Boston and Austin at the time. I seem to remember that rhyme, Boston and Austin. And, and I was thinking, you know what, man, if we can put this in here and we can play it, we can, we can build it up like they're doing. And, and I told everybody, we're going to be playing this thing for five years. No one believed me. We put it in there. We played it for, I think, 10. Mm. Every Friday and Saturday at 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock, because we only seated 104, a little mini theater, you know, small little thing. But, but it brought memories to people. Uh, uh, I still, not as often as I used to, but run into people that, that saw it there, and it was actually a life-changing experience. There was this one guy named Kim. Kim, I forget his last name. And Kim told me, he said, Rocky saved my life. He said, he said, I was in Westport this one night. He said, I was just walking down the street. I was getting ready to end it all. Man, my life is, you know, I'm just ready to end it all. And he said, uh, this, this 
pretty lady came out and these Tyson was doing this dance, the time warp, she called it. I said, come on in, you know, watch this movie. So I went in there and sat down. There was so much love in there, everybody coming together. So I sat through the entire thing and, and, and I really, it, it gave me a reason to live. Wow. So I've been every weekend since then, never missed a weekend for it. That cool. was Kim, that was Rocky. Yeah. yeah that's Holy yeah. cow, it, and it, that it, guy today owns Amazon. Yeah, he probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. probably. Hey, uh, t tell me about these um, movie families around the Kansas City area. There's a oh, lot of them, yes, right? yes, yes. Um, well, the, the Durwoods and the Dickinsons are two of the older ones that just mm -hmm. immediately come to mind. And you're familiar with the fact that uh, uh, AMC Theaters, American Multi-Cinema Theaters, which was Durwood Theaters originally, is now the largest theater circuit in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, over 11,000 screens in uh, over 1,000 locations around the world. I mean, they are they are owned with I think the Chinese company. Yeah, a company called Wanda that. Dalian is the primary uh, owner of it, but uh, you can also, uh, you know, the stock is still available on it too, although mm -hmm. it's down to like eight bucks or something today, which is a pretty big drop. But uh, but yeah, Stan Durwood and Dick Durwood, it was their father who really started uh, mm -hmm. the whole thing going. But uh, they focused primarily on downtown Kansas City. So back in 1969, when I was transferred here with uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayor as their branch manager, uh, uh, they only had theaters that I recall downtown, except they might have opened the Ward Parkway, which was theoretically the first twin in the Multi world, Park, theoretically, yeah. and we hope that it was. Uh, and uh, later the Metro Four, the first four screen theater, but they had like the Town Theater downtown, the Roxy, the Capri, uh, the Empire, the Empire I think was called something else at the time, I don't remember. Uh, but, but Stan Derwood was one of these characters that, that one does not forget very easily. No, he, he was only died. something else. He, he had some fabulous ideals for downtown, which have finally, finally reached a, a lot of his realization now. I mean, he was mm -hmm. the guy back there that, that wanted to make create that uh, that critical heat downtown that we're now uh, enjoying. The Power and Light District was actually his concept. Of, it was. I mean, uh, uh, in general Entertainment, terms. I forget uh, what they were yeah. calling things mm -hmm. back then. But yeah, but Stan did some great things. And I have grown to respect him more. My business dealings were with him were, were, were more, you know, he was the exhibitor, I was the distributor, so, you know, we were okay, but, but never really connected in certain ways, although he always remembered your birthday. He, no, he had, that had was that, his thing. that facility for being able to remember your birthday. Everybody met birthday. you once, man. He met you he once, was, he knew he was birthday. pretty. He was wow. he, he had some type of a mnemonic device that he used. I don't know what it was he did. Mm -hmm. But but since since Stan passed away, uh, I've interviewed and done oral histories with some of his early employees, like Greg Hogue, who was with AMC 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, George Kiefer, who was came up with the name American Multi-Cinema for whatever combination of reasons, and, and other people, and they speak about how much Stan cared for his employees. And I'd never looked at him from that point of view. I'd, I'd been more just the fiduciary, not uh, not personal interrelationships and everything like that. And uh, he, was, he was just loved by his people because he took care of them. But as far as the outside world goes, Stan was a... He would do or say anything he wanted to say. I remember when Alan Carr was in town getting some kind of an award. He was a, a gay director, producer, mm -hmm. and, and Stan made some some remark that today would, would get you excoriated, but he got away with it at the time. I remember when he was talking about the downtown development, it, the, the Star Times ran a little article and saying, and Stan says that what he'll do to control the crime is he'll put snipers up on the roofs. And I was thinking, oh my God, you can't do that, Stan. You can't promise that. You know, never heard anything more about it. So he, he was a fascinating guy. And his brother, his brother Dick is still alive. Yeah. And uh, Butch and I uh, uh, worked with Dick. Dick owned a, a little eight screen theater up in St. Joe. Uh, mm -hmm. called the Plaza Theater, and uh, uh, Butch and I operated that theater for him for a few years till he sold the real estate recently. But the, the Durwood family, and of course his his Dick uh, had some unusual kids. sport coats, I remember that. He dressed fairly loudly, yes, he did, <laughs> he did. A uh, big mattress prince you're probably yeah. referring to. Uh, I've uh, seen uh, some uh, photographs uh, of him, uh, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, but the, 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 the Derwood family, of course, uh, uh, Glenn Dickinson's family, uh, the Dickinson Theater's here, and then his sons, uh, Wood Dickinson and Kent Dickinson also got involved. Mm -hmm. you've got, I grew you've up got, going to that one in Mission, and uh, the little the, the screener. Dickinson and they Mission? had a screener there, sure. and then they had the big theater there, uh, well, the regular theater. The screener was across the street. They oh, had okay. The private screenings. Okay. And 
Yeah. Uh, I don't even remember that private screenings. But uh, yeah, but the Dickinson Theaters for many years operated some of the best theaters around. The, their Glenwood was the, the, the theater of choice for mm -hmm. many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they sold out to a, a buddy of mine, Ron Horton, quite a few years ago, or actually they sold out to John Hartley, and Ron was a small shareholder, and then he ended up buying it. But the, the, the company that is really making waves right now other than AMC is B&B &B Theaters. You're talking about a bunch of bright, sharp, young people who are really doing some good things, man. They are building theaters that are competitive with any theaters in the world. Right here just in up Kansas in the City. Up in Liberty. Uh, saw the movie yesterday last week. What'd you think? I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was delightful. I thought it was a cute, good-feeling little movie. Yes. But anyway, the theater is wonderful. It's, I've it's, met it's, the people. and they have the bar up there and the jazz nights and all kinds of Is that of a stuff. local company? Uh, it is. Uh, Liberty, Missouri. Yeah. Uh, it, it, actually, it, it, it was uh, two companies that, that went together. The Elmer Bills, outside of uh, Salisbury, Missouri own several little small theaters and the Sterling Bagby in the Kansas area own several little theaters and Sterling's son Bob Bagby is the guy who's president of the company and his son uh, Sterling's grandson Brock is also the guy kind of in charge of marketing mm -hmm. and then uh, Brittany and Bobby Bagby uh, uh, Bob's daughters are, are very much involved in the company yeah. so it's a family company but they've gone from you know 20 30 40 screens to several hundred screens really oh yeah yeah well, maybe some people listening haven't been tell tell me a little bit about what what the unique attributes are. Well, every theater has those comfortable seats where you automatically lay back and they're heated and uh, you can order the food and uh, the drink and and uh, it's just a, a nice, good, clean place to go. A, a variety of different theaters. I think they've got one of their theaters that has the uh, atmospheric stuff going on. Yeah, the, the 4D theaters. Yeah, they've got two or three the, like that. Uh -huh. and, and they've also got, uh, uh, where they're building their newer theaters, so they'll have an auditorium that's specifically geared for entertaining young kids prior to the movie. Oh, yeah. So they've got all these little devices little play area and things to show on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And they do a uh, good yeah, job. but B, yeah. B and B, uh, you know, we're we're really proud of what those guys are doing. Do They're they own the things. twin drive-in theater now, also? Well, they, they, they lease the twin drive-in. They theater. lease it, okay? Uh, yeah. yeah, I booked it for about twenty-five years. Talk to me about drive-ins around the area here. Well, let's of mention course. some. Uh, I remember Highway Forty, Hart Drive-in, mm -hmm. uh, Leewood. Help me out. What the Fairyland? Yeah. Uh, there was a, so many drive-in theaters around this area for a while. Well, th let me give you just a couple of little comments, mm -hmm. then, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, the, the Fairyland Twin Theater. Okay, that was operated by uh, the Finkelstein family, although the Broncados were owners uh, mm -hmm. of a good chunk of it. Myron Finkelstein was the manager of the thing, and Myron was the one who did the booking and buying. And I, and and. What happened was later in the 70s, because of the, their demographic audience there, in these two screens, they would have one screen, it would be some type of kung fu fighting type thing. They're always, they, they were really big back then. The other screen would be a so-called soft X film, you know, the, uh, the sexy stories. Mm -hmm. Not hardcore, but soft X. Sure. So Myron came in one day and he said, you know, I got so tired of people asking me, which screen is it going to be on? He said, I put up two signs over one on each screen. The one said sex. The other said violence. <laughs> they don't ask me anymore. They just, they just go in sex and violence. You know? That was the 63rd Street. The Highway 40 drive in. Uh, uh, a couple of guys we hadn't mentioned, Lou Vaughn and Martin Stone. Mm -hmm. Lou Vaughn and Martin Stone were, again, two of the nicest, most creative people that this town has seen. And back in the uh, late 60s, they would have gotten together and built their first drive in the I-70, which would have gone uh, hammers to tong up against the Hart drive-in and the 63rd sure. Street drive-in. Yeah. But it, it, it was a success immediately. Shortly after, they built the twin drive-in in Independence. Mm -hmm. Then they built the state twin drive-in in Kansas City, Kansas. Then they built the North Twin Drive-In up in North Kansas. Now what City. era was all this building going on? In the 70s. 70, okay. And then uh, the South Twin Drive-In in Olathe, which is now where the studio theater is located, as a matter of fact. So so they had, and they bought the Lake Park Twin. So they, they, they dominated the drive-in business here, although you also had the uh, I-35 Clayco Drive-In. Well, Clayco, I had Claycomo up there, in the, yes. or the Clayco, I, that's what I always sure. went to. I was grew it? up in that area. What about yeah. the Hilltop Drive-In in Gashland? Oh Remember yeah, hilltop. One? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. okay. 
the Riverside Drive. I remember Riverside was always the one yeah. where, you, oh, you're going to the Riverside. <laughs> oh, I now, know what's going on there. <laughs> that, that was that was a Commonwealth Theaters yeah, uh, uh-huh. building, and which was which was a, at the time in the '70s when Poe Seeger was their director of marketing and advertising. They were one of the largest theater circuits in the country. They were the largest drive-in theater circuit in mm-hmm, the country, mm-hmm. and mostly just small towns and numbers wise. So, yeah, we've got Commonwealth Theaters. Richard O'Rear was a, a, a chairman and head of a Commonwealth for many years. Fabulous company. They were solid as a rock. Yeah, good. What do people. you think about what Butch has done down in North Kansas City with Butch, his place Butch down who? there? I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, Butch. that Butch guy in the next office. Oh, over the Rickleby guy. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, hey. He's a, you know, the, but Butch is, is one of my dearest friends. Uh, he's like a kid brother almost. And, uh, you know, he came up with the idea of the Screenland. Let me tell you how, okay, the Screenland restaurant, the Screenland Cafe was located at 18th and Wyandotte. It was mm-hmm. the heart of Film Row. Okay. Martin Stone and Sylvia Stone owned it. Okay, Martin was Mid-America Theaters. Okay, in addition to the drive-ins, they also built the Blue Ridge, the Seville, the Chateau, Mm-hmm. The Truman Corners, the Watts Mill Theater in Heath, Ohio, and a couple other locations. So they were indoor and outdoor. Uh, but Martin and Sylvia had owned the little Screenland Cafe there. And before Butch took that name and, 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 and protected it, uh, he asked Sylvia Stone if it was okay if, if they used their name, you know, and I've always yeah. respected him for that. But uh, uh, Butch has done a, he's done a great job in, in again playing films that 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 appeal to a particular market, mm-hmm. uh, just like um, uh, like Jerry Harrington has done uh, mm-hmm. at the Tivoli, which we we are still regretting the demise of the Tivoli Theater yeah. and always will as far as that goes. Well, we owe him a lot for yeah. fighting that battle for a long time. Absolutely, all those. Absolutely, uh, and of course Jerry started in the Bijou Theater, right. you know, uh, mm-hmm. working for uh, my wife Summer after I had mm-hmm. uh, left Kansas City in 1980, 81. And um, and then uh, uh, took over the lease and renamed it the Tivoli. And then when the Manor Square Three Screen Theater across the street opened up, he moved his Tivoli operations into there and operated them both for a while. But uh, but Butch did a great job there at Seventeenth and Washington. And you know he, he his idea of, of using you know the fat chairs, the recliners, and everything. Uh, I know that the AMC people sent people down to just examine some of his mm-hmm. buildings. Sure. And now he he's not involved on a day to day basis. He still owns it, of course. But he's got two great guys who are operating his armor situation and crossroads situation. Okay. Uh, 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 Adam, Adam is just uh, terrific. Yeah. Adam and Brent, uh, great, great people. And and boy, they are always full of ideas. But yeah, we're, we're really proud that Screenland Theaters is here. I'd love to see Butch continue to try to expand his brand. It's just that he's got so much on his plate right now with all the real estate that he's developing yeah, like he's this. Yeah, he's a busy guy. He's keeping really busy. And this well, is a beautiful building. Really oh, is, well, yeah. Where yeah, we are, 601 yeah. East, 63rd Street. More yeah. to come, I guess, east of here. Yes, absolutely. Well, plus, you know, other buildings around the, the city that, that he is... Uh, uh, I've got to ask city. this here. Sure. Um, I don't know if I dreamt this or not, but maybe you can verify it. seems like I was driving down in central Missouri at one point on a highway, and I saw a movie theater set up that was circular, and the cars would pull up to a small screen, and there was a projector in the middle that projected to all the screens, and it was right in front of your car. Did that ever exist, or did yes. I dream that? No, you did not dream that. And they played mostly, actually started in Joplin. Uh, okay. I forget the name of it, the Circle something like that. Yeah. Not Circle Jerk, yeah. but uh, the Circle something drivers. Yeah. And uh, 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 he would play soft X films in those, and everybody had their own little individual screen. In it front of the car. for several years, right there in You're the car. kidding. Yeah. And this this would have been in the early 70s, early so to mid 70s. So much Ray's playpen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, let, let me tell you, Ray's playpen. Pin. When I hear that name, I think of Jay, because Jay had a small bit in 69 minutes. Jay Cooper, yeah. Jay mm-hmm. Cooper, where he walked out of there with an inflated love doll and got <laughs> on the bus. And as I recall, he was demonstrating some of the orifices or something on, on that love doll. So you, you say Ray's playpen. That's the last time I was in the place, too. That All right, let's jump in there for a minute. Ago. Yeah. Who owned and, and booked the Dove and the old Chelsea theaters? Oh, boy. 
I don't. That wasn't you. Oh no 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 yeah. no no. They they were hardcore. I, I I did not get involved in hardcore. Okay. The soft X's as we called them. Yes, sure. you know the again swinging cheerleaders type and the soft X's like that. But the hardcore stuff was um uh, I, I didn't didn't want the onus that was still yeah. involved with the time. But of course I I knew of or knew the people. I just don't remember the names okay. of the owners. Uh, although one of one of the guys that worked with me at Thomas and Chuck Films later went to work in one of these, and I remember him telling me a story about taking the print of Deep Throat and putting it in a big bucket of water to destroy it. Uh, it was uh, that was <laughs> seems like those soft X's you're talking yeah. about ran forever yeah. because they they would advertise these in the Star. Yes, uh, Emmanuel or whatever, yes. I, and I, you would mm. just see perennially you would just see these ads for the same film. They really well. Uh, they must have made bank or something. Uh, those soft X's we did well on. We couldn't play them in a whole lot of theaters, but but we did well on. And incidentally, there was a lady in the uh, uh, who had an X-rated theater locating in the uh, uh, Union Station. I'm trying to remember her name. I've even got a couple of ads from it. So you might not know that they used to play X-rated films in the Union Station right there in the main thing. They had a little wow, little, they little had theater, a theater there. there too. Yeah, circle yeah, theater. yeah. That was it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if circle, but there was a theater mm -hmm. in there that played the X films. The soft, soft X wow. anyway stuff. Yeah. And could could I jump back one quick minute and sure. tell you about? But because this is actually in response to Lloyd's question about <laughs> how I got from Florida maybe back into the business. Uh -huh. Okay, after I was totally wiped out and would spent what money I had left down in in the. Um, uh, Key West. Uh, I got a call from my daughter that an old buddy of mine who had worked with Roger Corman for years had a really good gig running an independent company out of New York City and he wanted to talk to me about giving me a job to get back in the business and of course I was like God at this point I gotta do something so so I jumped in this pickup truck that I had a little, little camper on the back and I put all my fishing supplies everything that was left over that I had on top of it like Beverly Hillbillies and inside that thing and started the drive from Florida uh, all around up through to Los Angeles mm -hmm. to talk to Frank about going to work for him in New York City uh, where the home office was this company called Almy Pictures uh, that had bought Cinema 5 releasing and Libra Films two very prestige the two most prestigious independent art type film operations in the country and they own them. So I jumped in my pickup and, and started that long drive. I ran out of money about in Mobile, Alabama, so I started trading stuff out of the uh, back of the truck for gas and sandwiches. You know, I'd look for the little back back door like service stations that, you know, that I knew I could get away with and, <laughs> and trade the stuff. So I made it to Memphis where I had family and then they stacked me for enough to get to Kansas City where I had family. And they stocked me enough to start the drive from Kansas City on over to LA. So here I'm motivating that this, this truck still loaded down with everything that, that I had left, because uh, all my good stuff I'd sold or hocked, you know, uh, prior to that. Uh, uh. So I got in Vegas and said, I'm gonna splurge. So I found this little motel outside of Vegas, checked in there for a night instead of sleeping in the truck. And they have one of these TVs sets in there where you put the quarters in, you mm -hmm. know, for 15 minutes. So I watched television for a little while and then continued my trip to LA made it to LA, met with Frank like the morning after I got there, made a deal with him. He loaned me a thousand bucks to buy a, a, a sport jacket and some slacks and shoes because I was in my fishing regalia, that's all I owned at the time, um, and, uh, and, and got me a ticket to fly to New York. So I had to put my truck with everything left in storage there in LA. So flew to New York, and the company put me up in a, a really nice apartment there, a really, really nice apartment. It, it, it's in the gentrified area of Hell's Kitchen that they call Clinton, or they did 30, 40 years ago, whenever it was. Okay, so here I am suddenly in New York City. The week before I was fishing in Key West, two weeks before, With your whatever. bait shop blowing in the bag. <laughs> so, so here I am in New York City with this gig as VP, General Sales Manager, USA, Canada, Acquisition, Distribution, Production, all, all that mm -hmm. crap. Uh, uh, but uh, and then a week after I got in New York City, uh, there was this huge convention going on called Show West in Las Vegas. So the company flew me to Vegas, a suite at the MGM Grand. So in a period of two weeks, I went from that quarter machine in that little place to a suite at the MGM Grand, and that's exactly maybe encapsulates my life in a nutshell. Oh I mean, wow! That, it, it's been just kind of like that. 
And you know what? I mean, whether you're up or down, you're in or out, as long as you're, you're surfing alive life, your aren't you? Working, man, surfing nothing life. Nothing else matters. <laughs> nothing else matters. That but, is phenomenal. Uh, but I love wow. that trip. Love that trip. Yeah. Uh, what's the film industry like today? What's going on in there? Technology Ooh. and things. I think we talked about oh, that a little bit. Man, a double double, boiling trouble. I mean, it's just uh, no projectionist really around anymore. And, um, uh, I, I think they're, 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 the union is called the IATSC, the International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees. Mm -hmm. uh, they were like. Uh, in fact, I had to contact them to find out some stuff about Frankie. I don't know that they have any. I think he was the last living union projectionist in this part of the country. Although maybe in Chicago and New York, some of the other markets, they might yeah. have one or two. But no, essentially, you know, your employees have to operate that equipment because they are really merging with the elevator operators. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because you've got to you know, yes, keep uh -huh. that critical but, mass. Of course, what's happening this year? That that's uh, what's happening. There's so many things happening on so many levels. But but uh, but. What uh, uh, what Disney is doing in, in entering into their streaming, and what Warner Brothers doing entering into their streaming, uh, what Universal will be doing, uh, what Amazon and Apple are doing, uh, uh, I'd say that things are in a in a state of. Uh, God, not uproar. Yeah, a, a state of uncertainty is what it boils down to. Right. Now, now, a buddy of mine in Wichita, Bill Warren, builds the finest, most luxurious theaters in the world. And I'll defend that statement mm -hmm. in the world. He sold his circuit uh, a couple of years ago to Regal, but he, but he is next in two weeks. He's opening his new 12-screen ultra luxurious marble etched glass anything the best that money can buy outside of Oklahoma City again, Midwest City. Wow. Uh, but uh, oh yeah, Good but guy. but there are still people building theaters, yeah. and the big circuits are still uh, uh, converting the old sloped auditoriums uh, to, of course, the fat chairs, uh, the food, and the the drink, and, and that's mm -hmm. just. Uh, uh, and B and B is really on the leading forefront of coming up with other innovative ideas, like the theater they opened up an hour recently. I know has a bowling alley attached to it, oh, okay. and, and they're just doing they're doing outreaches to make things more regional than just to see a moving wow. image. I'm still waiting for the day when they have walls all around you, floor, sides, ceiling. Yeah. It's all yeah. projected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they stick glasses on you, Dick. Oh, do they? Yeah. Is that 3D? Yeah, that's, oh. that's uh, no, virtual reality. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Oh, uh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. and, and, of course, 3D is really in the midst of a huge demise right now. Yeah. You know, I uh -huh. mean, it's, uh, people yeah. just aren't buying that at the movie theaters. We'll usually have one show a day in 3D for the first week and then drop it. But I like wait, this. I'm waiting for 4D to come out. 4D? Well, it's, 4D is out. That's what they're uh, calling that, something. That's what yeah. they're calling uh, those those seats you were referring to. Where it snows to, on that, you. That, that move like that and <laughs> splash stuff in But do they have people stuff? outside making sound effects? Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we you need. You know what? It, 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 it occurred to me. Your voiceover actor's a job again. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It occurred to you. You're, that's your particular petard there. That, <laughs> it, is that really how you make your living, Loy? I mean, is, is voiceovers more now? Is that really what you do? Well, I've, I've been or? doing that for 20 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, still with William Morris. Yeah. Ever. Same, yeah. Same wonderful oh, agent. Wow. Really? Cool. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like it leads to good stuff then. Well, it's... Uh, you know, it's a little bit related to the industry you've. Oh, of course dealt it is. With. I mean, you know a lot of folks in that business, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Hey, look, can we talk about the Boulevard sure. Drive-In? Sure. Because we pass that up when sure. we we're talking about drive-ins. Sure. There's a, you, you have a story, about Ruby. Oh, okay. Boulevard Drive-In is located adjacent to Turkey Creek. Over the years, it, it uh, once or twice annually, they will flood, and the water will, I mean flood, I mean by that, inundate the concession area so that it takes a boat to get out there. Uh, it has been fixed now, uh, you know, now they have built it up so that they, that hasn't happened. But uh, quite a few years ago, uh, after, after the, the double feature ends, uh, the employees go out to the field and pick the field, they call it, you know, pick up the bo popcorn mm -hmm. boxes and stuff like that. So Ruby was the one doing the boulevard driving this one particular night. This was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning after everything had ended. And, and the rain started coming in. Uh, it had rained the day really bad before, too, and, and the rain started coming in there. So she ended up going into the concession stand area so that she could stand up on stuff and get out of the water. She immediately called West Neal and said, I am stuck in the concession stand. I can't get out. It's flooding. Come get me. Wes somehow or another ended up with a boat 
and took the boat out to the concession stand area. Okay, at that time, the water had risen to such a level that she had climbed up on the, uh, the, the, the glass concession thing and was standing on one of these milk cartons like this, and the water was still up past her waist. So she was sitting there waiting for that little boat to come paddling out there. It, it came paddling out, and the water started dropping enough so that she splashed out of the drive-in, I, I mean, out of the concession area uh, to the boat. So they grabbed her, pulled her up into the boat. She slid right back in the water. They grabbed her the second time to pull her up in the boat. They couldn't keep her in the boat, back in the water. The third time, she finally stayed in the boat. What had happened was, the coconut oil had floated to the surface and coated her like a greased pig. Oh my. And, uh, <laughs> but the bottom line is, and, and they said, well, you know, Ruby, weren't you afraid, you know, being stranded like that? And she said, no, I knew Wes was going to come get me. Oh, you know, yeah. She had that much confidence in him, and she was right, he did. So this and, thing is one of the last remaining single screen single drivers screen. in well there's around 350 locations nationally but but you've got to have you know the, the economy of scale if you don't have it operating just about any business anymore it's just difficult you know that, that's why you know you see four screen and six screen drive-ins are the ones that do the most business so yes the boulevard it's, it's because of the family the neil family that has just insisted on keeping that swapping shop going every Saturday and Sunday, and because West Neal loves that drive-in mentality, he loves ninety-one he, right now. At the time of this, uh, he is taping, ninety-one yeah. years mm -hmm. young, as a matter yeah. of fact. And he still gets out there all the time. Mm -hmm. Now his grandson uh, Brian uh, really uh, is the operator and the runner of the thing there. He mm -hmm. and his wife Clarissa, yeah. and uh, a lot of family employees. But quite frankly, it, it's by focusing on the family that that's allowed us to keep that drive in viable and yeah, strong. Yeah. And two weeks ago, on our opening weekend of Toy Story and Aladdin, we set a new house record for that drive. Mm -hmm. That drive is almost seventy years old. We had the biggest weekend in history. Wow! Uh, uh, two weekends ago. So that's wild. How do yeah, people find out about what's going on there? What is that? Boulevard Drive. Boulevard Drive. Boulevard Drive. Dot com. You yep. know, uh, like us on Facebook. Visit our website. Yes. And you have some involvement with that? Oh, well, no, I, I get a small piece of the of the box office because I program it. Oh. Uh, I'm the one who determines what movies are going to play. Okay. I do the negotiations on a given Monday. Sure. This Monday I was fighting with Disney, actually, on next week when we open Lion King because they want me to keep Toy Story with it, but I'm not going to because mm. we've played it for, we've been for four weeks already. We've got a finite audience there. We're not a... Ten million dollar, ten million metro area population here. So, but but yeah, that's what I do. I program it. I, I book it as such. Well, will that's you apologize to Wes for me about <laughs> the, the, the about the thing with Tommy Micah's fifty seven Chevy convertible? I, I, I will the it, trunk because we all got in the trunk. I, I think I think oh, he's got okay. that license plate number of that particular car. You could maybe send him so. a couple bucks. Now <laughs> I guess if you I want. could. But, but yeah. you, you should you you should go there some evening. Uh, Brian Brian his grandson has really done some innovative things. But that's first okay. kind of theater I went to where you could listen on FM. Yeah, it was the, the first theater the in the in world, car. as far mm -hmm. as we know, yeah. the first drive-in theater to install that digital sound. Mm -hmm. And I know we're the first drive-in in the world to install 4K digital projection. Yeah, the other drive-ins had 2K, but mm -hmm. this he did this. But what he also did was he invested in a camera. So, uh, so before the movies play, you've got all these kids running around waiting for this and that, and, and they, they bring the camera out and they film the kids doing this and that, and it shows up on the screen. Oh, so the cool. parents are in the car, they're watching they their watch kids the on kids. this 100-foot screen. Oh, I love it. It's yeah. just, uh, you, know, you know, great it, ideas. It, it's a long time since we used to take the spotlights on the side of our car and shine them up on the <laughs> screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> now it would be laser pointers. Yeah, and we, exactly. we don't want that either. But, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the boulevard perseveres, man. It does. That's they, great. They, they do a great job. Love to see that thing still, that anachronistic thing still thriving. It's wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Can't believe that the same guy is still yeah, alive. Yeah, yeah, still doing it, yeah. What a bunch of stories. Uh, before we leave, let's get into Searching for Summer, the new okay. book that's sure. out yeah. that Brandy did. Tell us a bit about that. Okay, uh, a lady named Ann Tizon Spry, who does personal memoirs, mm -hmm. uh, uh, had... had, had had arranged to have a gentleman come out and check her house for the uh, 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 insulation, and Brandy's husband does that. So uh, he was working there at Ann's house, and uh, uh, Brandy happened to be with him on one of the gigs and came in and, and, and introduced them. And when Ann heard that this is Brandy Ship, who was the daughter of Summership, she had followed the thing real closely. She couldn't believe it because she had always been interested in the story yeah. and uh, bottom line is uh, uh, that was about three or four years ago 
But uh, and Brandy had been approached by other people to do a book, but there just wasn't any. I mean, she was interested, but not interested. Uh, but Anne, Anne was just a, such a delightful lady and so sincere. Um, and Andy and, and Brandy and uh, and Anne co-wrote it. Anne did most of the actual writing, but Brandy set up the interviews and did uh, you know a lot of that background information. A small portion of it's going to be uh, 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 donated to the Q, which looks for missing persons and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah. And uh, it, it's it's a story essentially to let people know that Summer Shelf was a lot more than just a, a, a young woman, a woman who was grabbed and killed, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to her than that. And the book is really, it's like an homage to her friends and associates, uh, a lot of little anecdotes and stories, different people talking about their memories of Summer, a lot of photographs, and they do cover the trials and everything like that, but Good. it was... Yeah. Uh, she uh, was it, it, a, a really, I knew Summer quite yeah, well. Yeah, that's right, you she did, was, I knew her through the Bijou fantastic. also, yeah. Back and I, you know, the Sweet Bijou lady. had the wonderful uh, the posters with all the schedule, and I actually did those for a few years for oh, summer. Oh, did yeah. you? I didn't that know that. was a paste-up nightmare. Calendars. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh yeah, back I'll in the old that, days yeah. with the exacto right, knives right. and the I spray see that mount. Big at the top of oh, the, uh, uh, the. Yeah, absolutely. But she was a lovely, yeah, she lovely was. lady. She she was. She absolutely was. She was. Uh, that's uh, that's one of those unfortunate things that happens, and you know we just. Uh, but you know what? The upshot, one of the many, many upshots, there are so many wonderful people in this town, in this city, in this area. You just, you just can't believe all of the help and the assistance that, uh, that Brandy and, and the family was given during mm -hmm. those, those yeah. dark, dark, dark days. It sure, was, uh, yeah. Just a and marvelous, you can get the book stuff. on Amazon, and uh, I think uh, Amazon and uh, other places. places yeah. I, I'm sure that Ann will be placing them in bookstores around here, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know, bibliomania yeah. and places. Anything we haven't talked about that uh, uh -oh. is oh, still Lord. rattling around in your brain well, uh, that needs to be told? <laughs> uh, I tell you what, give, give me one quick second. Oh sure. yes, 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 yes. Tressy Souders. Tressy Souders in 1922 was a maid at 5500 Ward Parkway. Now that's the place that Wade Williams owned that for a few mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Now the, uh, uh, oh, the doctor, the uh, lawyers, I forget their name on it. Uh, at the time in 1922 when she was a maid at that address, it was owned by Mac, 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 Mac Kemper. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, a, well, I mean, it was a huge thing, as you know back then. She directed and produced the first feature ever directed and produced by a black female filmmaker in the United States of America. Really? Wow. Oh, Tressie yeah. Souders. Her real name was Teresa Ann Souders. She was 25 years old. She was born in 1897, that's right, in Frankfort, Kansas. Her family had been part of the diaspora of a lot of black people leaving camp, leaving Kentucky and other places and coming back further south, and uh, she got her mother got pregnant along the way and she delivered a baby there in Frankfort, Kansas. They weren't able to take care of the baby so they adopted this baby out to a another black family to raise her as their own. When Tressy was 12 years old attending church, her birth parents and family descended upon the church and grabbed her, took her away, from oh, what I hear, yeah. forcefully, and said, she's our daughter, we want her back. Okay, it was a huge cause to live in the black community, as you can imagine. Again, this would have been, if it was, if she was 12, uh, okay, then that would have been, uh, when, 9? Yeah, 1909. Mm -hmm. It went to court, and the custodial rights were given back to her birth parents, so that's who she graduated from school with. And she was a little bit behind. Okay, when she was, uh, in 20, no, in 1918, she would have moved to Kansas City. Bottom line is, here she is, 25 years old, a maid, black, Kansas City, Missouri. At that time, Walt Disney had two or three years earlier gone out to the coast to work with his brother. Uh, uh, at that time, you know, our, our, our jazz scene, our blues scene, uh, uh, the music scene here was going, dance, you name it. And uh, this film was called A Mother's Error. And, and I'm convinced uh, there, there are no copies of it that anyone has been able to find yet, but, uh, but there was an ad in Billboard magazine uh, talking about the movie, and there's, a, and there's corroboration on even Wikipedia. If you go there, you'll see Tressie Souders, usually given credit for being the first black female filmmaker. Okay, from there, in the later 20s, she moved to L.A. and supposedly to get maybe involved with the, uh, uh, with the black 
filmmaking community there, but it never happened. She ended up living in San Francisco as a maid for the rest of her years, died at the age of 98 years old. She had saved money to have her body sent back to Frankfurt, Kansas and buried. So I took my shooters, the Kelly boys, to Frankfurt about a year ago, and we interviewed uh, uh, the, the local historian there uh, who's been researching her and, and other people, and talked to some other people in Kansas. She's never been recognized even in the state of Kansas, but I ran into Vicki Henley and some other people there who are, we're gonna be doing something about that. And we're gonna get her, we're gonna get her some, some notoriety because people should know that Kansas City has produced these people that, that, that are, again, iconic figures with a moving image that no one's ever heard of. Wow. But that's Tressy Souders. Tressy there, was a, Souders. there was a huge black community making films back then. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a doctor, I forget his name. There was another lady, uh, uh, Maria P. Williams, who produced and directed a film in 1923, the year after hers. Uh, Kansas City is just full of history if you start digging down into it. It's, it's amazing. And there's a lot more history being made. We've got a fabulous, fabulous lady who runs our film commission here. Stephanie Scuffum, have you ever met her? No. Uh -uh. Oh, then you must. She is absolutely, she is a, a, an asset this city desperately needs to help bring more production into the area. And we've got a great independent production community that's been developing here. You guys know because, I mean, you're peripheral to everything going on that involves entertainment. Well, I know that the tax deals that they come up with do make a big impact. Huge. Because when I'm out, when I was in L.A., Yeah. Uh, I know that a lot of people were coming here for a while, and then it ran. It runs hot and cold, depending upon what the tax t incentives are. Yes, among absolutely. other things, and then the union status and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, what's the scene like right now? How is it working out? It's working out lousily when it comes to tax incentives. You, you know, we had something going uh, uh, for the state to bring back. Uh, uh, to, to bring back, I forget how they were going to structure it. Um, but I'm not certain whether that passed or not. I don't know what mm. the latest is on that. The city itself has a really small fund that Stephanie can use for small independent things. But, uh, uh, you, you know, states like Georgia and Louisiana, man, they've just, uh, wow, they spend tens of millions of dollars. Of course, Georgia's having some problems right now, so maybe that'll benefit other people. And of course, Canada's always been, as you know, a great place for filmmaking. Uh, they're not making quite as many of these big films in uh, LA as they used to. It just no. ain't working that way. Give me a few star stories, stars you've met, de oh, things you've dealt okay. with. Well, you know what? Shorama. The mm -hmm. Shorama Convention was approximately 1958 to 83, approximately 25 years. It was the largest theatrical convention in the country. Uh, several thousand people would come, all the top stars would come. Okay, I remember standing, it started out at the Muehlbach and then moved to the Crown Center. And I think that was the last home for it. But uh, I remember standing back with a, a, a group of people and Jack, a young Jack Nicholson, this had been again 40 years ago, uh, wearing blue jeans, sport jacket, white shirt and tie, you know, just standing there and uh, starting to look nervous, starting to sweat. And, uh, uh, and finally they were getting ready to call him to come up to the, the, the dais there so he could get his award. And he was uh, standing there, he was saying, you know, oh, what, what am I supposed to say to these people? You know, what, what should I say, you know? And someone said, you know, just thank them and tell them you're glad to be here and you appreciate it, you know, that's all. So he was sweating doing this and that. Finally, they called his name and he starts walking. And uh, you remember the movie uh, uh, where Kevin Spacey at the end of it starts walking, right? Seven, I think, no, The Usual Suspects? Okay. Well, there, here's the bottom line. Bottom line, okay. He's walking through the crowd there, through the tables to go up there. And as he takes every step, man, he starts becoming Jack Nicholson. And by the time he's up there in front of the mic, man, he's, you know, looking around with that look on his face like that. And I forget what he says, but everybody was like, ooh, and an on. And he was perfectly comfortable and at ease. And <laughs> that was Nicholson. Okay, now, uh, one of the funniest ones uh, was, uh, uh, give me a second here. George Burns, and George was, he was old even then, man, real old. But uh, we had set up uh, a, a deal with one of the model agencies, either 50 or 100 models in swimming suits to escort him into the uh, the banquet room, the banquet space. So here he comes in with all, those, all these pretty women around there. And he's standing up there at the mic with a cigar like this, you know, looking around like that, looking at those women, and he says, you know, I don't have, know how to say this, but half of you are going to be disappointed tonight. <laughs> and the audience absolutely <laughs> fell out of their chairs. They absolutely loved That's it. That's funny. What a uh, guy. Uh, another one. Gosh. Another one. Uh, 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 Jack Lemon. Jack Lemon, and, and I didn't really get to spend much time with him, but some of the other people did. 
one of the nicest guys they'd ever met in just every level, they said. But this particular angle was told me by someone whose last name is Durwood. I won't tell you his first name. Mm -hmm. And he was there. So uh, uh, here, here's what happened. She was, uh, uh, Diana Ross was sitting up there on the dais next to Jack mm -hmm. Lemon. They both had movies in for whatever it was. I forget what, mm -hmm. what they were at the time. So in the middle of the banquet, in the middle of the banquet, uh, uh, Jack Lemon, uh, 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 Diana Ross, stands up and politely walks around back there and sits down at one of the tables in front that had an empty chair, and I think that Dick was there. And after the event was over, Dick, at, I'm sorry, whoever it was, asked her, um, you know, why did you leave in the middle of that like that? And she said, well, Mr. Lemon had been drinking a whole lot and he needed to urinate and he didn't want to leave so he took the wine glass and he filled it and set it down on the floor and I didn't want to stay there. Oh my that gosh. Was a, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Dick, I thought that was your track. <laughs> Lloyd, Lloyd, we've learned something today. <laughs> you, you thought you had invented that, eh? Yeah, as they say. Wow. Uh, now, Joanne Woodward and uh, uh, Paul Newman. Paul, yeah. Delightful people. Uh, at the time that I was involved in, in picking them up or taking them to their suite, uh, and, and, and the suite uh, at the Crown Center on the top floor, you guys probably know it. You got, and I, mm -hmm. I can't believe I remember 45 years later, but you got the state suite, the plaza suite, the royal suite, the presidential suite. Those were the four big money ones. I would always get, because I thought I was such a big shot, uh, I would always get the state suite or the plaza suite. Those were my favorite ones, okay. So, so uh, during this convention, I mean, of course, I was representing so many of these independent companies that, that you know, I, I was really, really busy during that. But, but so the place was always full. And, uh, uh, oh, and Clint Eastwood used to come up there at least a couple of different nights, I remember coming up there and hanging, hanging around. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, nice fella, and uh, give me a second. Oh, okay, Joanne Woodward. She would fly, Paul Newman would not fly at the time for whatever reason, so he took a train in and she flew in. But but they had it scheduled so that it was, we picked her up at the airport and then came to the train station and picked him up, took him into the hotel. And when they walked into the, into whatever suite it was we had for him, uh, I remember both of them just stopping and looking around and saying, you didn't have to do anything like this for us. This is way too nice. My job was keeping Coors beer uh, in, in demand in the refrigerator up there, you know, because oh, yeah. he was a big Coors wow. beer drinker. But, uh, oh. oh, yeah, there were so many stars that came in. And, you know, this was a big deal back in the 70s. And, oh, let me tell you, quick, quick Wolfman Jack. Uh, uh, there was a movie called Hanging on a Star that I was going to be handling in the Midwest. Wolfman starred in it. So we brought him in for this deal. And I went with the limo to pick him up. Back then, when you took the limo to the airport, they had a big Shorama banner on the side. We had a motorcycle cop in front, a motorcycle cop behind, pulling over traffic. Pulling over traffic to get to the airport to pick these people up. I mean, oh, I can't even were... imagine something like that. <laughs> I'm <And> from Hollywood. <laughs> Pull over. <laughs> <laughs> and we would use mostly, uh, 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 mostly off-duty cops uh, as the limo drivers and bike drivers and everything. So 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 the Wolfman came on out. He got in the got in the back of the car and he reached in his pocket to pull out a number to light up. And we said, Oh no no no, we've got an off-duty cop driving here. And he said, I ain't leaving until you get another driver. So so I took the driver for a walk and I always carried extra fifty-dollar bills around to tip as necessary. You guys know yeah. how that can go. Uh, so so I, I gave him a fifty-dollar bill. And said, Man, I apologize, but can you get one of your other uh, the drivers that's not a cop to come out? You know. So it, we had to wait twenty or thirty minutes, but finally another driver came out, got in the car, and uh, Wolfman. Okay, thank Don't God. Don't deny yeah, the boy. Wolfman his <laughs> reefer. The movie was held up and would never even went into release for some legal problems, lawsuits yeah. back and forth. I don't remember, but that was a uh, wow. my buddy Jerry Jones, what Radio City Jones. City with my hands. <laughs> wow. Uh, my, my buddy Jerry Jones. When, when you see, if you ever uh, get bored enough to look at that little doc uh, called The Film Peddler. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's talking about he worked on Tunnel Vision with me and some some of the movies that I handle, but he's got a a, a great the way he describes Wolfman is just uh, just oh, vices man. like that. Gosh. Yeah, I mean cool, it's all cool all the stars that you ever heard of would have been out there. Wow. So all right, 
uh, as far as uh, okay, last week Pharaoh, yeah, the the I just have to put in a plug for the Pharaoh Theater, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh Cinema, Independence, in, Independence on the yes. square there. Uh, you, you have to hand it, have to hand it to to the folks there, the McLeans, mm -hmm. Cindy and Ken, who continue to operate the square there on such a high level. A lot of good business, and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and mm -hmm. that little four screen theater is a little dollhouse. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the old fashioned neighborhood type theater, but it's a marvelous addition to the square. And uh, I've it been booking good. it for twenty or thirty or forty years. Good. Officially. They always have the new the, the new films in there, so well, you're doing a good job. We do. Thank yes. you very much for noticing. All right, yeah. cool. All right, gentlemen. Well, Anything what a else? fun conversation, I'll tell you, John. I I'm not even sure I can get out of my seat buckle here. I mean, this has been quite a wave <laughs> yeah, of I, stories. I, I didn't mean to develop it to a soliloquy, but well, that's uh, good. Uh, you, that is you just invited it. it. it you, what a ride! Talk, you, what you, a ride! You, you didn't slap me, <laughs> and it's still going on. That's the fun thing, man. This is so fabulous to be uh, to 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 be an older gentleman, older fella, <laughs> and still every every day wake up, you know, and 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 just be. Wow, thankful, man. Well, you're I'm a real prize for it's Kansas good. City. I mean, oh, no, no, no. Uh, that, 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 that's a super. Uh, no, thank you. We got I'm, any I'm, film? I'm, I'm, you know, there's a lot of film action here, and you've been in the center of it all. So. I, I just. Uh, well, at least I, since I, the uh, toiling Nickelodeon. In the, toiling in the vineyards, just like uh, uh, everybody else, but uh, uh. I've just been lucky to have a lot of really epped people that, that I've hooked up with. Now, uh, one other quick thing. The documentary things you're doing, where can we see those? Where, what's happening on those, well, uh, your historical stuff? Okay. Uh, uh, my initial perspective is purely doing it to save it, to mm -hmm. save the information, to okay. save the stories, uh, to, to, to save the perspectives of these people who, and, and forgive me for repeating that, who have toiled in that vineyard for so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've interviewed, I think, eight or ten different people. Uh, as far as the, the final presentation format, we're not really certain yet, but but for certain, uh, I did talk to Ann McPherson, who's a, uh, an historian for here and there, yeah. and, and we want to be sure that this information, that these interviews, these oral histories that we're recording will be available for research for people in the future who might be looking, uh, what about AMC theaters? How did that start? Or how sure. did B&B, how, how, did, how did this thing, how did all this stuff come about? Uh, but also, we've got some fantastic short vignettes, people like, uh, I saw a mention on one of you gentlemen's uh, uh, pages somewhere uh, about uh, uh, Jody Rovick's sister uh, that you knew, went to school mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Right. I think. Uh, Janice, yeah. Yeah, yeah Janice. Uh, Jody, we talked to for about an hour here, got fantastic stories. People like George Kiefer. Uh, uh, you know, who worked with Stan in his early days, uh, in his Ward Parkway days, in, in the creation of the circuit. Uh, we, people like Jack Posey, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, so uh, uh, Butch, even, I've spoken to. He's the youngest one yet. Even Butch? Even Butch. Well, Butch has got some really good stories, man. No, I'll bet he does. But Butch is, Butch is, he's a... Uh, we you probably should have gotten you, you Butch, and Jack in the same room. No, let, you let the lies no. fly. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Well, now, who's producing this? Is this... In, do you, yeah, or, is, or is there a group, me. or are there other well, people the, the, helping? The Kelly boys, uh, the guys, uh, yeah, are, are the ones who are shooting it and who will end up editing it and doing everything. Uh, again, this uh, we're looking at this as probably a, a one and a half, two year project, mm -hmm. and, and we've done maybe 15 or 20 percent of the people that we want to do. So okay. uh, it, it's we're just gathering the background information, is the bottom line. But we're uh, we're, we're, we're saving these stories the same way that we've been saving all of these movie posters, 35 millimeter. I've got maybe six, eight thousand 35 millimeter theatrical trailers, you know. Mm -hmm, I've yeah. got an underground storage bin. <laughs> uh -oh, yeah. My wife has for years been saying, huh, why? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but but, but it, as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's treasure. It's wow. not trash, you know. Well, John, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for such a great, great day of stories. This is wonderful. Oh, and well, how kind of you to say so. The one thing I want you to remember to let Loy and myself know is the next time there's a screening of 69 Minutes. Yeah, You know what? I that. will. I will. And we will okay. set something up. All for right. Sure. <laughs> thanks, hey, thanks a lot, gentlemen. I've enjoyed being able to uh, reminisce there somewhat. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Well, here we are in the Dick and Loy editing suites. And uh, well, uh, thank you, John Ship, for joining us. What great stories you have. We'll be back with more incredible people to talk to on Dick and Loy's Media and Marketing Mayhem. But ho, 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 what, what, what are you doing? No, no, you're not supposed to look around here. This is private stuff. No, 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 no. Get away from that. that no, that's not for you to see. That, uh, uh, go back to your computer. Uh, shut off your phone. Oh, did you? Uh, uh, Lloyd, sing us out of here. 
You might love it, you might hate it. It's my favorite freaking show. 